Wireless Land Professionals Podcast, Episode 152. Wireless Land Professionals is a place to educate, inform, encourage, and entertain those involved in wireless lands. This Wireless Land Professionals Podcast is an audio manifestation of these goals. Our host is a wireless land veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. And now, the podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Hello, this is uh, Keith Parsons again with Wireless Land Professionals Podcast, and today I'm here with Ian. Ian, uh, how do you pronounce your last name? Beyer or Beer? Beer, beer yes. Beer. Beer be more fun for... Uh, I, I, I tell people to spell it as beer with a Y in the middle. That See, that works. That works well. Uh, Ian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Where are you? Uh, I am actually currently at home in Kansas for the moment. Um, I was out doing site surveys yesterday in Dallas, and... After that, I'm going to be taking a couple weeks to move. Oh, there you go. Um, so you kind of hit on the on the wireless land professional scene in Austin back in 2014. That's like four years ago when you gave a, a presentation at WPC there, our first WPC in Austin, on uh, and kind of a unique Wi-Fi experience you had. You want to tell us a little bit about your Hollywood movie experience? Sure, and I'll, I'll put a disclaimer on that that I put that ten talk together about ten minutes before I went on. So, so it was it was a little hastily prepared, but it 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 seemed interesting to the to the conference. So I uh, I figured I'd go up with it. Um, this was back in about 2012 when they were working on production for the movie Nonstop, which was a uh, Liam Neeson action flick. And I was contacted by a fellow who has probably the coolest job in New York in the film industry. If you're a geek, what he does is he builds blinky light sets for the film industry. If it's got video on it, if it's got blinky lights, if it's a server rack, he makes those and he, he'll, he'll buy racks full of equipment and, and gut them and rewire them to make it look cool on TV. So he contacted me about this, uh, this project where they were filming this scene inside of an airplane. And one of the, uh, one of the things that happens is that there's news about what's going on in the airplane that comes over the in-flight entertainment system. And so they had to put all these video screens in the back of all the seats in the, in the set. And this was being done, there was a product placement. And so what they ended up using were uh, seven inch tablets. And they needed to find a way to stream video to all these tablets at once so that it would look like it was, everybody was seeing the same thing. So basically it looked like it was actually wired. Right. And and because they were Android tablets, it was not particularly easy to do that. Um, you can't wire them in for power. You can't wire them in for, for data. You have to do it over Wi-Fi. So what was your magic trick to make them happen? Well, my magic trick, and I'm going to throw up another disclaimer in that I know a lot more now than I did then. And um, what, I, what I ended up doing ultimately didn't work nearly as well as I'd hoped it would because um, I figured three uh, ubiquity second generation access points were going to do it for some 75 tablets. Why not? It's just 25 well, for AP. Well, in order, Who cares in order, about airtime? In order to make this work, um, they had to all sh be showing the same thing at the same time. And in order to do that, you have to do it with, uh, with multicast. And that's when things get really tricky. Yeah, Wi-Fi and multicast are one of those things we, when you hear it, you just kind of cringe. Right, and 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 this was the the earlier um, ubiquity access points that really didn't do so well when they were under load, and you know, averaging fifteen or twenty clients on each of these APs was was enough to cause them to fall over, and so that was not an ideal solution for for the problem. But it was it was certainly my first foray into uh, wireless design, and between that and the conference, that was that was kind of the beginning of my CWE journey. And how did it finish? Well, it finished in that it sort of worked some of the time. Um, they were able to um, at least use it to send a trigger to the uh, to a custom app on these things that put a green screen up on each of the tablets when uh, when it was appropriate. There were a couple that they were able to stream to in some of the scenes that only had one or two of them, and they ended up you know doing the rest in post. Which you know there's there's the the saying in in the film biz, you know, we'll fix it in post. Well, that was that was definitely the case that go that happened here. Not a terribly easy thing to do, but that's a you know that's why they get paid the big bucks there. 
Actually, my question was, how, how is the ending to your CWE journey? Well, um, I was granted CWE number 273 uh, about uh, two months ago. Yeah, um, congratulations. And I, I took my CWNA test at WLPC in 2017 and set for myself a goal of having my CWNE application in by the following WLPC, uh, which I beat by a week. That, that's, uh, <laughs> so you got it from CWNA to CWNE in one year. What, one year and a bit. So there was a, there was a bit of a backlog uh, because the CWNP folks were Work well, on I mean, a whole, I mean, you did, whole bunch you did, of things at the time, but uh, but you yeah. did your part though. You yeah, got your I, part I, done. I did. I did my part uh, within the year. Yeah. So I mean, part of part of the CWE is, is you have to have you know multiple years of work experience as well. So it's not like you could have started fresh with that one year plan. But that that means you got all the exams, all the write ups, all of the blog posts, everything done in a year. Uh, that's very well done. Right, and I'd been blogging about wireless topics for probably close to ten years um, since long before I. Heard about uh, the WLAN pros and CWNP and all that good stuff when when some of these other guys with the single and double digit CWNE numbers were already you know veterans at this, and yeah, it was I, I ended up in the Wi-Fi business kind of as an offshoot of the of the streaming stuff that I was doing uh, as a consultant back in around 2011 2012. And it was an industry that was becoming very quickly commoditized. And I saw the writing on the wall that if I didn't find myself a, a new skill to get really good at, that I was, uh, I was effectively going to be um, out of a job as a, as a streaming consultant. And that's largely come true since the streaming. I didn't even know, I didn't even know that was a career. Well, it, it, it was for, for a brief time there. And a lot of what I was working on was infrastructure. And a lot of what the consulting market is in that field now is uh, custom code solutions. And uh, I'm not a code guy. I, I code enough to be dangerous. And I think that's more than enough. It's one of those things I think everyone in this industry is going to have to embrace more than we probably do already. I mean, some of us are doing a really good job of that. The rest of us need to kind of follow along. Um, so you you finished CWE in a year worth of focused effort. Uh, what's next? Uh, well, next um, I'm hoping to uh, to get a couple of um, maybe Cisco or Aruba certifications under my belt to make me more marketable in those fields. Um, I'm actually in the process of transitioning to uh, to a new job where I'll be doing more wireless. Um, I've been working for an MSP for the last year, doing some wireless, a lot of just miscellaneous IT infrastructure stuff. Um, but I'll be doing more focus on Wi-Fi and, and getting good at that, and um, also hoping to uh, to be part of the Echohal Masters program. Uh, so you have you applied? I have. Uh, so any answers yet? Not, not, not yet, I mean. not yet. But I've I've got a couple of projects I've been working on that uh, that should be great for it. Show up. Hey, look at me. I got really good stuff here. So get me get me into Masters. Good plan. <laughs> um, so you also do some volunteer work, uh, and it, it involves Wi-Fi and IT. You want to tell us a little bit about your your volunteer efforts? Well, sure. I uh, I volunteer with uh, Team Rubicon uh, as well as the IT Disaster Resource Center. Um, my role with Team Rubicon is that I'm the regional technology manager in what is known um, in FEMA circles as Region Seven, which is the area of Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri. And, my and, and both ITDRC and Team Rubicon use the same FEMA regions? We do. And my role within that is that I'm the regional technology manager, and my job there is to make sure that our people out in the field have the technology tools they need to do what they do. And sometimes that involves working directly with ITDRC, uh, especially on some of the bigger operations. Uh, so, so there's a, a synergy going on between those two organizations that's that's really cool. So, like um, Team Rubicon needs some technology, and ITDRC provides it. Right, and and TR does have some of their own technology capability, but when we're dealing with a larger scale disaster, uh, along the lines of what we saw last year with the hurricanes, um, both in Puerto Rico and in Texas, ITDRC has a lot more capability that they can bring to bear um, on a larger scale, and then. Sometimes on some operations, TR won't have the folks in the field that they need to do the, the tech stuff, and they'll contact ITDRC, who will then provide that for them. So how much of your work with these volunteer organizations involves you going on site, or can you do it mostly remotely? 
Uh, there's there's a little bit of both. Um, last year during the hurricane in Texas, I was down at the uh, Team Rubicon National Operations Center in, in the Dallas area working on getting technology logistics spun up for this. Uh, the hurricane was still going on when I was down there, and we had people going in and out doing boat rescues. And what we were trying to figure out is how do we provide the technical resources for the hundreds of volunteers that we're about to mobilize into this area and how do we obtain those resources? Where are we going to get them? How are we going to get them there? What do we need? You know, what what are the conditions on the ground? How do we deal with things like wisps? You know, so we don't interfere with them. Um, there's just a whole host of interesting logistical problems that go on on the back end without actually ever setting foot in the disaster area. And uh, did you also uh, end up in Puerto Rico for part of that? I did not, unfortunately. I uh, I used up all the available time I had with uh, with my employer, my family, doing the logistics in Texas. I, I would have loved to go down to Puerto Rico. Um, there's there's still operations going on down there for, for both organizations. And so, you know, maybe there's maybe there's something else in the future for that, but not currently. Would you, I mean, since you're involved with both, would you recommend this to others who, are, who might have some, you know, they're, they're new, they, they don't have a lot of experience. Is this a good way to earn some experience by doing volunteer work? Well, well, kind of yes and no. Volunteer work is good. However, in, in many cases, if you don't have the experience and need the experience. That's not necessarily the greatest place to get it. Uh, sometimes we just need somebody who really knows what's going on, that knows something really well. Uh, you know, if you're in kind of a secondary uh, assistant type role, then I think yeah, it's a great place to learn. Um, but if if you're going out solo and and don't have the experience, that that could get a little bit uh, challenging in the field. Yeah, I, I I kind of saw that as soon as I asked the question, I went, oh yeah, send someone out. Uh, not a good time to learn when you have a lot of pressure on you. Yeah, although for for some of us, that's a great way to learn um, learn f- uh, yeah, further and deepen trial, your trial and and deepen your skill set. There's there's nothing like a deadline and that kind of pressure to to get you to figure out what you need to. Yeah, but when when there's actual literal lives and families and on the line, that might not be the best best time to to practice. Right. Uh, um, good. You're all you also have a lot of experience, and uh, we met before at church IT uh, roundtables. Uh, you've got a lot of experience in church. You want to tell us from a Wi-Fi standpoint, uh, anything unique about the church environments that you've worked in Things well, from uh, a Wi-Fi standpoint? Uh, church environments are, are definitely an interesting environment for Wi-Fi because you've got kind of a combination of dense public venues in the auditoriums and sanctuaries, and then you've got your just regular enterprise office stuff. And one of the fun challenges that we run into is is figuring out how to put these APs in these auditoriums. And you got a lot of churches that, you know, they, they believe the vendor hype when an AP says it'll support 500 users, and they'll just put one in the sanctuary. And then next thing you know, I'm getting a call going, hey, my Wi-Fi doesn't work in the sanctuary. Can you help me out? It's okay. They have 2.4 gig uh, video backhauls. Right. And, and there there are some interesting production uh, equipment conflicts that arise as well. You've got companies like Teradek that make wireless video transmit and receive systems that operate in the five gigahertz band. You've got, uh, and this is a particularly common one, you've got the audio engineer who's going to throw a little Apple Airport Express or, or a Linksys or something you know, really cheap and low performing. They'll just throw that up, plug it into the soundboard so they can remotely control their, their digital soundboards using an iPad somewhere in the room without any consideration of any of the other um, RF that's in the room. And of course, these are the same guys that as soon as you step on their wireless microphones, they they scream at you. Well, it's it's their RF, you know. Right. So any, anything else special other than, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential interferers from a design standpoint. How do you design differently for that compared to other, other kind of enterprises? Well, wh- what I've been recommending to a lot of these churches that I work with is that in the larger ones that they actually have somebody on staff who acts as a frequency coordinator. Yeah, if there's any RF in the environment, whether that's the the portable radio for the facilities and security team, whether that's wireless microphones, whether that's Wi-Fi or video transmitters, basically anything that's that's a transmitter, you know, coordinate that with somebody. It doesn't have to be their full-time job, but you know, there's got to be one point of coordination to do that um, because otherwise everybody starts stepping on everybody and then nothing works and nobody's happy. Kind of a RF czar. Right. And, and there, there are some churches that are big enough that that could be um, a full-time position. Is there enough? Um, a lot of big churches also have on-site daycare, uh, classrooms, et cetera. Is there um, 
much interference, co- I mean, self-interfering between their, the sanctuary needs, the office needs, the school needs? Well, wh- one, of the, uh, one of the nice things about churches when dealing with it from a design and interference standpoint is that most of these buildings have been built in multiple phases over the years. So, so you run into a lot of exterior walls in the middle of the building, and you can get really creative with using those as attenuation to isolate various sections of the building. I mean, it doesn't sound normal, but we really like thick walls. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm actually working on a presentation for the Worship Facilities Expo this fall where I'll be talking to church facility managers on how they can better design their buildings for good Wi-Fi and how they can design better Wi-Fi for their buildings. And And I'll be talking about using that attenuation in a creative manner and designing the building such that the Wi-Fi can be more effectively uh, installed. Because what typically happens in these cases is they'll spend years and years designing a building and raising the millions of dollars to build it. And then once they've laid the carpet two weeks before they open, they go to the IT department and go, oh, by the way, we need Wi-Fi in here and we're opening in two weeks. You've actually done some of those. Yeah, hypothetically, of course. Not that I would know anything about that. Yes. Yeah. Not that you (laughs) actually had to go through that experience. Right. Uh, yeah, like, let's pull cable after everything's installed. Right. Well, I appreciate your time today. Is there any uh, parting words you want to give to our audience about uh, your process and how you might, you know, give um, you know, advice to anyone else who's along this path? Well, I yeah, my my path towards the towards the CWNE was was a little unorthodox, and that the the first training class I actually took was the the CWDP with Tom Carpenter because at that point in my professional life the design skills were what I needed the most. And and so that's what I started with. And I didn't take the CWNA until uh, two years later. Uh, and then I went back and revisited the the DP. And then, and then I also ended up doing um, CWSP, CWAP on the same day. They, I, I took those tests back to back because I found in the process of studying for them that there was uh, a lot of complementary material between them. So I, I learned both of those in parallel, and so it made sense to actually take the test at the same time as well, because all that information was was fresh, and it related to, each test related to the other one, and it worked out really well for me. Sounds good. Well, uh, I wish you luck in, in your new endeavor. Uh, keep us informed. And when you finish up your presentation on how to design, uh, we'd love to come back and talk about that and share that with the audience about uh, you know, I would love to be able to have something to go talk to architects <laughs> across the board, not just not just worship architects, but all architects, and let them in on a couple of the secrets on how they can help their own Wi-Fi by using their their skills and our skills together. Absolutely, and of course, like everything else, I I plan to blog about that. So sounds good. Well, good luck with your endeavors. All right, thanks. Thanks. Mentor minute. Well, Keith, we've been getting questions. Uh, things that people are struggling as wireless land professionals, this question has come in. How do I convince customers of the value of site surveys? Oh, wonderful question. Um, and, and the problem with the question <laughs> is <laughs> when they say site survey, sometimes they mean a predictive design, but they call it a site survey. Sometimes they mean a validation survey to, to prove whether or not it met. Sometimes they mean an AP on the stick survey when you're going to use it as a design tool. Or sometimes you mean an AP on a stick when you're doing a validation of a design pre-install. So lots of different ways to attach that word. So let's just start at the beginning in the process. The first process is uh, you need to clearly define the requirements. It is the probably, in, in my consulting practice, the thing that takes the most amount of time in design. Uh, at least 50%, maybe 75% of the time is spent solidifying, agreeing to, and finding the exact requirements that the customer needs and getting them to agree on it. Once we have the requirements, the actual design process is fairly fairly fast. So the first step after having design, uh, I do a predictive design using, I happen to today use ECHO uh, ESS, to design and redesign. And I say redesign as an, design is actually an iterative process. You go through the requirements and maybe they need coverage everywhere. So you first design for coverage. Then they need a voice grade Wi-Fi with secondary coverage. Then you add secondary coverage. Then you have to make sure that you have no co channel interference because capacity is driven by air times, not number of APs. So we have to make sure we're not getting co channel interference. And that's another design cycle. And as you loop through those cycles, 
it's an iterative. You go further and further. And at some point, you end up with a design that has AP placement, height, power, channels, whatever. And if you're not feeling really confident, and depending on how many times you've done gone through this process, you might want to, at that point, do an AP on a stick survey to validate your predictive. Because it's a lot cheaper at this point to validate an AP that, you, that Eckhau said, put it here, it'll go this far. So go ahead and take an AP, put it there, and match it and see whether or not your predictive matched reality. And if it didn't, now is a good time before you do an install to make sure you tweak that. And it's just one more cycle in the iterative process. If you're really super, super not confident at all, you might want to do 100%. Every single AP location that Eckhau says, you go on site and you do an AP on a stick to prove it. After a while, you've been doing these over and over. Maybe that percentage drops 180, 40, 20, uh, depending on how many times you've done the same type and you're feeling really confident that you've seen in the past, when I put an AP here, it acted this way, I maybe get down to a 10% uh, AP on a stick validation. Some sites that have heavy reflections, since most uh, predictive software today doesn't do reflections, uh, only attenuation, you might want to up that validation percentage of how many AP on a sticks. Then there's an install process. Post-install, we have a validation survey and a validation survey is to prove, did what the predictives say actually happen in the real world? And a validation survey is one of those that you must have. I tell people you may want to go on site. In fact, I think you should go on site to do all your predictives so you can get all the information while you're still there. But you must do a post-install validation survey. And so the question, that was, and that was just a setup for the, to answer the question. Yeah. The question was, how do you convince the customer? And... I like to talk to the customers about, uh, and systems integrators we, we speak with, who pays for a validation survey? I, I'm using a Wi-Fi term, but we'll apply it to cable. So when you hire a cable contractor to come in and pull Cat6 cable, who pays for that cable contractor to validate every punch down, every patch cord to make sure that it meets Cat6 spec? Well, normally in most situations in the U.S., in our culture, the cost of doing validation is borne by the people doing the install. So if a cable contractor gets paid for doing an install, they don't get paid until they turn over their validation results proving every cable was pulled properly. And if it wasn't, they will, while they're on site, fix it while they're right there. In Wi-Fi, uh, because of how we got here, it's a, a crazy world how we, we ended up in this place. Some people want to charge for the design up front. Totally agree, because every building I've ever been in, they paid an architect to do the design. Yeah. So for customers who are balking or wondering, should I pay for the upfront design? If you call it a, like a predictive survey, that just sounds, well, one, it sounds terrible because you're not predicting and you're not surveying, you're not doing either. But if you want to say, well, I'm going to charge you for the design, it's an engineering process. Uh, sound engineers, structural engineers, yeah. electrical engineers, architects, they all charge for design. So that's a very simple one to explain that way. The AP on a stick validation little side loop, that's more you trying to figure out, uh, you know, I want to up my confidence level. Now, some vendors, some ISVs are out there and they sell valid AP on a sticks as part of their process. And if they can sell it and the customer buys it, I'm all for it. The post-install validation survey, that validation is it exactly what we wanted, I think is, is a requirement. You have to do it or you never have a feedback loop to see if you're making any mistakes. But that's a really tough one to sell to your customer to say, I want you to pay me to prove whether or not I did my job right. Yeah. <laughs> then that's usually what, what's, that's kind of on the onus there. So depending on your organization and how you get paid, some organizations bundle the they charge for the predictive and the validation AP on a stick, and they don't charge for the validation. They include it in the cost of the gear. Some charge for all three, some charge for none. It's kind of uh, what you can get away with. Um, and where is it itemized out? So if uh, most customers I've seen are used to having the cable contractor pay for their own validation, so usually we have the installers pay for their own validation. It is a hard cost, and it just needs to be built into your into your system. Thanks for the question. Yeah, it sounds like 
just technique when dealing with any kind of sales situation is connecting it to something that that customer understands. Like here's an example where this most closely relates to, and then they're hopefully they're the light bulb can go off for them like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So maybe some of it's just... And I think it's using the right words. Yeah. You call something a word or a name that they don't understand, like predictive survey, it just sounds weak. Yeah. When it's an engineering design process, it sounds like something they, they expect to pay for. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks, Keith. And again, guys, if you've got questions, please submit them via Twitter or online. We'd love to answer the questions that you're facing. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. 10 Talks. Good day, everyone. Wow, this crowd's getting bigger. That's uh, that's pretty good stuff. Uh, My name is Mike Leibovitz. Uh, Also go by Mike Lieb. I work in the CTO office for Extreme Networks. I'm based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, A couple of reasons. One, um, that's where I was born. Uh, and two, that's where my company has our Wi-Fi engineering uh, facility. So I get to spend a lot of time um, in the United States. Today, for some reason, I've only been speaking to Canadians, which has been really interesting and all by fluke, including uh, somebody I'm sitting beside who lives two streets over from me. So that's kind of a, a pretty random thing to happen. Uh, Extreme Networks, uh, we, we had the opportunity to participate at Super Bowl in uh, three different ways. One, uh, we provided analytics at the game inside of Levi Stadium. Two, uh, we provided Wi-Fi coaches, which is actually a league-wide uh, program that we started uh, to help uh, kind of as a courtesy for the fans to get on Wi-Fi and understand how to use uh, Wi-Fi and or the apps. And number three, we participated at Super Bowl City. And Super Bowl City uh, was an idea that the host committee Uh, for the Super Bowl wanted to uh, really create an area uh, in downtown San Francisco specific to celebrate the 50th game, right, the 50th year of of Super Bowl. And so the host committee uh, asked uh, Extreme Networks to come and put in a temporary network uh, inside of the Embarcadero uh, Market Street area. Has anyone deployed a temporary Wi-Fi network? Has anyone deployed a temporary Wi-Fi network inside of a major city? Pretty good advice is don't do it. Um, <laughs> it's certainly not the, uh, the easiest thing to do. And obviously, inside of a, a major city area, you are contending with everything in terms of other businesses, other Wi-Fi networks, and, of course, service providers that happen to provide their own Wi-Fi network environment as well. A quick uh, overview, essentially what, what the uh, host committee did, again, they uh, peeled out some of the Embarcadero area. They set up a, a really big area with stages and all sorts of interactive uh, fan experience things. Again, you know, the, the, the game at Levi Stadium was out in San Jose. Most of the tourists and people that were coming, uh, they wanted to have an experience inside of the city. It was somewhat unique compared to previous Super Bowls uh, where typically the fan areas are, are in and around the stadium. So this was uh, downtown in the, in the city area. So deploying in the city, I was trying to get some, some better pictures, but suffice to say, not an easy thing to do, right? When you start talking about conduits and running cable, uh, particularly to have a, a network operating for one week, uh, you're going to do this above city streets. You're going to do this uh, as carefully and elegantly as you can, uh, but it's not very simple. Uh, David Coleman was talking earlier, uh, layer one. Uh, layer one uh, breaks networks uh, fantastically. When you, when you put in uh, temporary cables and you are uh, terminating those cables, you certainly better test them, and you probably want to test them more than once. Uh, it's, it's quite an amazing thing how quickly a wireless network will break when the wired backhaul uh, is not working. So, you know, running, running cables across the city streets, uh, not very easy. Right, uh, certainly things that you need to take into consideration to get that done uh, in a timely manner. Wired networks. So you know, at Extreme Networks, we provide uh, both wired and wireless technology. So we have the luxury of putting in the wi- the wired uh, back end of the uh, infrastructure as well. A couple of interesting things. When I saw this picture, uh, it was it was kind of funny to me. One of these IDFs. So you know, again, a temporary IDF uh, actually has a little bit of rain on top of it, which. I think uh, no one really expects. Ah, need another microphone here. Uh, a little bit of rain, and, and obviously, as probably many of you see, uh, there's quite a bit of garbage <laughs> sitting underneath that box as well. 
One of the things that was actually kind of cool about the way that the wired network was built, so 10 gig uh, interconnects between the switching, uh, the switches themselves, uh, running in a layer two loop. So we actually managed to convince uh, the cabling guys to actually loop the entire uh, city area that uh, we got to participate in. We're using a standards uh, ERPS, ERPS, uh, Ethernet Ring Switching Protection Protocol. Uh, the funny story there was that we didn't actually have the last leg uh, completed when the uh, when the network got turned on, our guys continually asked. It took us about 24 hours to convince them that we did need to complete the loop. Uh, they said, "Hey, everything's working. Don't touch it. Leave it alone." We said, "No, no, no. Let's let's make sure that the loop is is completed." And then uh, redundant multi-provider, uh, one gig uh, internet feeds, so two different service providers and uh, a couple of mechanisms to uh, load balance out those internet feeds. So from a wireless perspective. Uh, again, temporary, right? You're putting things in, you're putting them on poles, uh, you're doing this uh, pretty much without any sort of design. So I know a whole bunch of you are going to look and say, oh my God, here we are talking about uh, not designing Wi-Fi. Well, there's no way to design this. Uh, you pretty much need to spray and pray uh, your RF and, uh, and, and tweak it and tune it, right? So you're doing this on the fly. We chose to use 55-degree uh, antennas. You can see it up there on the pole with uh, an outdoor access point. Uh, so it was continually measured, tuned, optimized, but uh, really this is just a positioning exercise, right? This is uh, moving an antenna and uh, using your eyes and, and kind of your common sense as to where it's going to go. Uh, probably not surprisingly, we deployed 5 gigahertz only. Uh, we, we played around a little bit with 2.4. 2.4 is not going to work uh, inside of a city, particularly again where you have other wireless LANs and service providers that are providing Wi-Fi as well. So what did it look like? And I, I, I pulled some stats off our, off our analytics system. You know, Monday through Sunday, um, what did the activity actually look like? Uh, we saw over 64,000 unique Wi-Fi sessions. I should back up to say that the last point on my slide there, uh, single SSID, no portals, no authentication, no advertising. So nobody actually knew that this network was there, which uh, is very interesting in terms of the take rate, right? How do people actually know that there's a Wi-Fi network? They have to... Uh, look at it on their phone. So 64,000 uh, unique Wi-Fi sessions through the week, which is uh, pretty good for an unadvertised 5 gigahertz only uh, Wi-Fi network. We peaked uh, about 4,000 clients uh, on the wireless uh, network uh, Friday evening. So the game was Sunday, for those that aren't familiar. So Monday all the way through Sunday, we were collecting these stats. But Friday, Friday night was probably the biggest party that was going on. So about 4,000 peak clients. Uh, we moved about 3.5 terabytes of data through the week. Uh, everyone seems to be really um, enthralled by uh, counting terabytes these days. Uh, it's not actually my preferred uh, analytic metric to look at in terms of quality, but it's something that people can understand quite readily in terms of how much data was moved. This one I thought was pretty interesting. 59% uh, of the client devices, so this is an average through the week, were capable of 11 AC. So close to 60% of the devices that we saw that associated uh, we're capable of 11 AC, so certainly clients uh, are coming along and, and um, you know, becoming more capable. As the week progressed, the peak time shifted as well, right? So from a, a temporary Wi-Fi network, when you think about when people are going to use it, why they're going to use it, the peak time shifted from, you know, kind of the afternoon, late afternoon into the evening. So as the week progressed, more and more people were gathering into the night. Again, and just an interesting uh, way to look at it and think about how your wireless LAN is working. And this one, which, uh, you know, I, I showed it to one of my colleagues, and he said that should be 100%. But this is a really interesting point, actually, and, and David was speaking about it earlier as well. But somewhere between 98 to 99% of clients are actively using DNS all the time. Um, when you talk about Wi-Fi not working or, you know, slow Wi-Fi, uh, when your DNS isn't working very well, it's going to break your Wi-Fi or at least give the perception that Wi-Fi is not working very well. Uh, clearly the number one protocol. So I think it's an interesting uh, stat to pull out of the analytics and, and share it with all of you in terms of thinking about how to design and deploy your wireless networks. So here's the one that, uh, well, there could be some controversy, but I'll try to explain what I did. And it's very, it's kind of difficult to pull a single event over a few hours and compare it to something that occurred over a week. Right? And so I, I tried to do that, and this is more a perspective thing. I think people will, will kind of be interested in some of the stuff I show up now. What I'm essentially categorizing here are the top 10 applications that were used during Super Bowl. 
I categorize that by how much bandwidth they consumed, and I'll explain why in a second. And then I'm showing the percentage of fans that are using it. So the number one application that was being used, and I did this in reverse order, I'm not David Letterman, uh, so I could have started at 10, but I'm going to start at number one anyways. The first uh, application in terms of bandwidth that was consumed is, is iCloud. That may, that may surprise some people, that may not surprise people. So uh, during the event at Super Bowl, you know, about 70% of the fans, uh, were, uh, the devices, were using iCloud, but 56% on average during the week at Super Bowl City. Number two, <laughs> iOS updates. So you had somewhere between close to 30% of the devices uh, at Super Bowl using uh, iOS updates. Uh, about 17% averaged over the week at Super Bowl City. Now this one. No, nothing, nothing local. So it's, got, it's, it's all got to go out to the internet. It's all got to go out. The next three are really interesting, but I can't talk about them for certain reasons. <laughs> I've been muzzled on those ones, so we'll continue, uh, we'll keep moving on. I put them in for the sake of consistency. Um, <laughs> the next ones uh, probably won't surprise you very much, but Facebook comes up uh, as the number six, you know, 60, somewhere 60, 50, 50 to 60 percent of people are going to be using Facebook almost everywhere you go. The other social networks, uh, they reign uh, pretty well uh, as well, right? They're, they're certainly used very, very heavily at, at, in the Super Bowl. I thought the Twitter one was kind of interesting, Super Bowl, Super Bowl game, you know, over 20, 22% of fans were using Twitter, only about 9% during the week at Super Bowl City. I'm not sure where or why uh, that is, but hey, that's what the numbers said. And the last one I'm also not allowed to talk about, but if you find me at lunch or if you buy me a beer, maybe I'll speak about it. Now here's where things kind of get interesting, and I'll convert back to the other, uh, the other format of what I was calculating or looking at. So... When I took the two top applications by bandwidth, iCloud and iOS updates, about 35% of the consumed bandwidth, so I spoke about 3.5 terabytes of data, about 35% of that was just on those two applications alone. And the really interesting one is that at Super Bowl, the game itself, about 50% of the bandwidth. So a lot of you have heard, and this is pretty easy math, I'm not a mathematician, but you've heard the 10 terabyte number, I'm saying that about 50% of that was used by two applications. It gives you a pretty good indication of what the majority of that network was doing. And certainly, uh, you know, I take my, 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 I tip my hat to, to the team at Aruba and Chuck. Uh, certainly the network performed quite well uh, and Levi uh, under a lot of pressure. So one other stat, this, this number just completely blew my mind. Um, and so I had to share it. Last year, I kind of made a joke, uh, Super Bowl 48 how many blackberries uh, were in the crowd. We profiled exactly four blackberries. <laughs> now here's where things get really interesting. Super Bowl 49 and Super Bowl 50, you're talking, let's just round it up to about 50,000 devices over those two games that unique the Wi-Fi. So what was the growth rate? Anyone want to take a guess? Six, 100%. 25%. Pretty good guesses. This is what... This completely blew my mind, and it was the first stat, the first, the first thing I looked at at Super Bowl 50. Four blackberries. <laughs> so, the question then becomes, who are these four Canadians <laughs> that went to both games? And I got it figured out. I took all the MAC addresses, I compiled them, and magically and contextually relevant to Phoenix, we found four Canadians those being Steve Nash, certainly Wayne Gretzky, Drake, who apparently performed here at some point, and of course, a little bit of a stretch, but he's on his way to Aspen, uh, my good friend there, uh, Jim Carrey. Interesting stat, uh, completely blows me away. So uh, overall, uh, you know, Super Bowl City was certainly a great, uh, a great thing for Extreme to get to participate in. It was overall uh, quite successful. I think the fans had a great experience, and that's really what it's all about, right? That's why the NFL is, uh, is doing what they do uh, in terms of why they put digital technologies in the hands of their fans and, and if and when they want to go and build bigger uh, from it. So with that, I uh, conclude a little bit over time. I apologize. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Wireless Land Professionals podcast. The podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. 
Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Wireless Land Pros for all the latest news and updates. And also connect directly with Keith on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. Head over to www.wlandpros.com for this episode's show notes, as well as the latest in all things Wi-Fi.